Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, so uh, this week, attitudes, more than a precondition uh, of behavior. A sip of water because I'm dealing with my uh, September uh, allergies, hay fever. So we'll be dealing with attitudes this week. I'll focus on the definition of attitudes, what they are, how we go about measuring them, and the two major things we need to keep in, uh, in mind when we measure attitudes, uh, and then finally take a look at attitude change. All right, so attitudes. Uh, love this uh, uh, piece of trivia. Uh, Gordon Allport keeps on popping up in our class, even though he is not a social psychologist. He was a uh, personality psychologist, but again, a uh, brilliant psychologist, so he came up with a, one of my favorite definitions of attitudes. The concept of an attitude, he says, uh, is probably the most distinctive and indispensable concept in contemporary American psych uh, social psychology. He was saying this back in 1935, uh, before Kurt Lewin came to America and changed it. But I like this uh, statement from him because it shows that attitudes have always been a very important part of American social psychology, and even back in 1935. And so uh, how he actually defined it is that attitudes are a precondition of behavior. That is, if you think about what that term means, a precondition, so that before you act in a certain way, you're going to do, develop an attitude, and the behavior is going to come from that attitude, and that makes a lot of sense. And uh, as we'll see, uh, you know, uh, both in this video lecture and the live uh, class, uh, that idea of the precondition of behavior may or may not be accurate, but it certainly is important, and especially important to social psychology. So let's talk about how we go about measuring attitudes. While, uh, you know, Allport had a very good and interesting definition of attitudes, uh, Eagley and Chaikin in 1993 came up with a really good modern definition of attitudes. Uh, attitudes are the psychological tendency that is, it's a psychological uh, desire or something that we often do uh, where we evaluate something, uh, entity, uh, with some degree of favor or disfavor. Uh, by favor or disfavor, they literally mean positive or negative, thumbs up or thumbs down, uh, or uh, anything like that. By entity, we're talking about a person a place, an event, a thing, uh, that's the type of entities we're talking about. So if I ask you, uh, what do you think of Manhattan, thumbs up or thumbs down, that's your attitude about Manhattan. If I ask you about Bill Clinton, thumbs up or thumbs down, that's your attitude about Bill Clinton. Uh, let's go back and take a look at a brief history of the measuring of attitudes. Uh, Back in the 1920s, uh, researchers felt that attitudes existed, but they could not be measured. And so in 1928, an uh, uh, important book by Thurstone, who was already a, a recognizable psychologist at the time, uh, the book was entitled Attitudes Can Be Measured. And as you can imagine, he felt that we can measure attitudes. However, uh, his book really didn't create that much of a splash in social psychology because his methods were complicated. Uh, it was only in the 1930s uh, that uh, Likert uh, developed a five-point scale for measuring uh, attitudes. And so, for example, this would be an, uh, an example of a Likert scale measure. I, after I drink a Pepsi, I feel, and we have an anchor point here and an anchor point here, and uh, the numbers are not equally spaced, sorry about that, but then you would be expected to circle a number to indicate how you would feel positively or negatively uh, to this event of drinking a Pepsi. And uh, a couple things about the Likert scale. 
uh, this has become an extremely popular method of measuring attitudes and you've probably seen these several times a day now a uh, couple interesting points about them uh, while Likert said it would be a five-point scale today we should be using a seven-point scale if you use a five-point scale uh, theoretically based on the the mathematics behind it we would not be able to analyze that data using some of the uh, favorite methodology of psychologists that is means and standard deviations and t-tests and ANOVAs uh, only with a seven-point scale because with a seven-point scale uh, people mentally uh, think of that scale as an interval scale and you should learn about that in statistics and so because with a seven point or greater scale they're thinking of, of it as an interval scale uh, we are allowed to use the statistics that we are happy to use and normally use the mean standard deviations and t-tests and often you see uh, as the anchor points agree or disagree and people who uh, do this for a living they generally tend to avoid these agree disagree anchors uh, because uh, they say people get confused by them and it's better to have a very definite thing as an anchor point so those were some of the major events in the early history of measuring attitudes uh, the next two events come in the 80s and the OOs, uh, the 2000s. In the 1980s, a major step forward in measuring attitudes with the tripartite or three component model or the ABC model. It has several different names. And the tripartite or the three component model basically says that you need to measure attitudes by measuring three different components, a thinking component, a feeling component, and a doing component. Uh, the thinking component is called cognition or cognitive component. Often we call these beliefs. Uh, the uh, uh, feeling component is called affective, moods, emotions, feelings, psychological, uh, physiological changes, excuse me. These are all part of the affective component. And then finally the behavioral component uh, that is behavior, uh, past behavior or intentions to behave or predictions about future behavior uh, and in fact uh, remember I said it's the ABC model A B C and statistics show uh, that the three types of questions measure attitudes better than any one or two types and here we have the Pepsi scale and we can see that we have here uh, uh, two examples of one of the categories. Here we have two examples of another. And here we have, wait, am I doing this right? Nope, did it wrong. Let's go back. We have three examples of one uh, category three examples of another category and three examples of the third and I leave it up to you to decide which is which and there's a spacer because we're moving on to a new section in measuring attitudes and then as I said in the OOs uh, you know one of the things that we discovered is that uh, attitudes are not unidimensional they're multi-dimensional or actually uh, you know uh, bi-dimensional so let's talk about that what do I mean by unidimensional uni one dimension we felt that uh, up until the uh, 2000s that attitudes really were, were only in uh, one dimension that is anti to pro uh, just as uh, you know uh, Eagley and Chaikin said uh, that is uh, you say, uh, you know, you give people an item such as I blank Pepsi, dislike, to like. This is a unidimensional measure of their attitudes towards Pepsi. And in working with these unidimensional scales, you know, uh, do you like uh, Joe Biden? You know, one dislike, seven like. 
uh, in working with these scales, uh, researchers discovered that they were not working that well, you know, based on the statistical analyses of uh, how people respond and how people react to things in real life. Because remember, we're measuring attitudes, which means that, number one, uh, we question whether or not our measurement is the same as the actual attitudes in somebody's actual head. So that's one thing we need to worry about. And then also, because of Gordon Allport, uh, we want to know if the attitude in somebody's head predicts or is a precondition of behavior. So we would look at uh, measures of attitudes and to see whether or not they actually do measure the attitude people have in their heads, that is these Likert scales, and if they actually are a precondition or predict behavior. And these unidimensional scales were not working out. And researchers discovered it was because Attitudes do not exist as unidimensions or one dimensions, but they exist as two dimensions. So instead of saying, let's measure, pep measure Pepsi, I blank Pepsi, uh, what we need to do is not measure whether or not you dislike it to like it, but we need to break up the positive and the negative elements of that. So we need to have one question, which is going to measure your dislike of Pepsi whether or not you do not greatly dislike pe Pepsi, ooh boy, or if it's a low dislike, or if it's a high dislike of Pepsi. How strong is that attitude of your dislike of Pepsi? And then we have the other uh, paired belief or attitude, uh, the amount of your liking of Pepsi. Uh, you have a very weak liking of Pepsi, or you have a very strong liking of Pepsi. That is, this method does not really measure attitudes that well. To really measure attitudes well, you have to measure both the negative component and the positive component. Uh, for example, uh, we often ask people to uh, state their abortion, uh, their attitude on abortion, a very uh, controversial political topic, as you know, anti-abortion, pro-abortion on a unitary scale. Uh, but what we find is a lot of people will answer in the middle uh, and only when we ask people what are their uh, negative or what are their uh, you know anti views about abortion, what are their positive views about abortion and then have them rank it from uh, you know how weak to how strongly negatively they feel and how weak to strongly positive they feel, do we actually see that people are not just in the middle. Uh, and in fact, when you do give uh, a bi-dimensional scale to people, you find something very interesting. People mostly say that they are strongly against abortion and they are also strongly in favor of abortion. And this is what I was talking about before in terms of the research with just the unitary unidimensional measures of attitudes were not panning out because it wasn't that people were in the middle that they were strongly against and strongly in favor of abortion. And that's a very odd situation and so we had to develop a theory to really explain what was going on and to understand it. And so when we measure uh, you know, uh, attitudes by two dimensions, bidimensionally, what we discover uh, is that we could have several different responses in terms of uh, your, behavior, your attitudes. So we created this uh, you know, contingency table here to explain it. That is, here are your in favor or your positive attitudes towards something, abortion, Pepsi, whatever. Those in favor or positive uh, attitudes could be either weak or strong. And the negative or the anti-against attitudes can be either weak or strong. 
and if both sets of positive and negative attitudes are weak, then we would say that you are indifferent. Uh, how much do you dislike Pepsi? Not that much. How much do you like Pepsi? Not that much. So you're really indifferent about Pepsi, aren't you? Uh, but then, if you have a very strong in favor attitude and a very weak against attitude, we would just say that you're in favor. And that's really not hard to believe there. You are very pro-Joe Biden and uh, you see nothing wrong with him, so you are in favor of Joe Biden. And then finally, uh, we see the same thing here when someone strongly against but only weakly in favor of something they are generally against. So you are uh, weakly in favor of Donald Trump, but you are strongly against him, so you're against Donald Trump. But now, here's the interesting cell in this contingency table where both your positive and your negative attitudes are strong. And we call that situation ambivalence or attitude ambivalence. That is, you have ambivalent attitudes. Ambivalent is a word that means strong in both directions. And that really does uh, describe it. Not indifferent. Indifferent is you're weak in both, uh, you know, in favor and against. Ambivalent is that you are really strongly for and against at the same time. Uh, and so I think this is probably one of the best ways to visualize it. Here's poor Homer the angel on his shoulder and the devil and poor Homer doesn't know who to believe and that really is a good visual image of ambivalence uh, and as I said before most Americans are ambivalent about abortion uh, that is on a unidimensional scale they show up in the middle but on a uh, bi-dimensional scale they show up uh, at the end very strong both strongly against and strongly in favor, they have attitude ambivalence. Most Americans have attitude ambivalence about abortion. And why is this and how can it exist? Well, uh, it seems that two brain systems control the positive in favor and the negative against attitudes. And this is really not surprising when you say that because psychologists have known for at least 150 years that human beings have problems and animals too have problems with approach avoidance and this is a classic problem in psychology where people uh, are at the same time drawn to and afraid of something and uh, clinical psychologists talk about this experimental psychologists talk about this and now with attitude ambivalence so social psychologists are talking about this so two different brain systems control uh, the different approach and avoidance or approach would be the in favor or the pro, uh, the positive attitude system or the avoidance or the negative or the against attitude system. And they're not really connected. Uh, you know, evolutionary psychologists say they're not connected because they evolved at different times during our evolutionary history so therefore, uh, they didn't evolve in a way where they could communicate with each other. And so you have two different systems sending our conscious mind uh, impulses, and our conscious mind has to deal with them. And once I explain that, we can really start to understand more intuitively what ambivalent attitudes are. Ooh, look at that sonic milkshake. Man, I'd love one really really love one but then again I'm on a diet so I shouldn't have one likewise McDonald's or you could say for example ooh I'd love some french fries but then McDonald's doesn't have real french fries but they taste so good but they're not really potatoes are they uh, staying up late and looking at your tablet uh, you want to do that but you know you should be getting some sleep and uh, getting some shut-eye, but you just want to look at a couple more uh, posts. Uh, cigarette smoking, people want to quit cigarette smoking. Uh, they know it's uh, making them sick, but then again, uh, they just can't do it. So there's an approach and avoidance 
or an ambivalence about that. Uh, I have here Studio Wrestling, which of course is really fun, but it's really, it's fake and really stupid at the same time. So at least I have ambivalent attitudes about liking it. And uh, maybe this is the queen of ambivalence, uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, people loved her uh, as a senator. People loved her uh, as uh, a secretary of state. Uh, but people hated her as a political candidate. So you have strong positive and negative attitudes about Hillary Clinton. Again, all of these are coming from the fact that you are... Uh, Get up. So all of it is coming from the fact that you have two different brain systems. And one brain system is looking at this, the sonic shake, and they're saying, ooh, I want that. And it's sending you strong signals to go out and find a sonic and get one of those, oh god, those shakes are so good. Uh, but then another part of your brain is saying, uh, you know you're, you're not supposed to do that, you're on a diet, and so you have ambivalence. And that's how ambivalence works. Uh, of course, if we have ambivalence about things, that means in some situations we just stand there and do nothing, uh, but we can't do that sometimes. Uh, we have to vote, and so we have to make a decision. So how do we make a decision, or how do we... Uh, make uh, a choice between the two competing uh, impulses. And uh, there are two methods that people use to deal with ambivalence and to resolve it. Uh, one is to allow trivial situational factors to determine behavior. And the other one is to use psychological distance to determine behavior. So let's talk about trivial factors first. This is where you use trivial factors in the situation uh, to allow you to uh, resolve the ambivalence. So quitting smoking, uh, you have ambivalent attitudes about quitting smoking. You're really jonesing for a cigarette, but you know it's bad and you want to stop. And what usually uh, you know, ends a lot of attempts by smokers to stop smoking is when a friend of them offers them a cigarette. And this is nothing planned, this just happened, and uh, that's when they basically give up. And the better way to visualize this is to think about a balance scale. And we have, you know, the uh, I want to stop smoking things weighing here, and the I want to keep on smoking things weighing here. And if you're in a state of ambivalence, the weight of the two scales are equally balanced. And so what happens is something that you don't plan on happens, something that's probably random, as I said it's trivial, something probably not under your personal control, and a random weight is added to one scale or the other. And depending upon what trivial random thing in the environment it, it is will determine whether or not you stick with your uh, you know uh, quitting smoking plan or light up again and indeed that's how it works for all of the uh, pr things uh, you decide whether or not you're going to vote for Hillary Clinton based on trivial things in the situation uh, that is uh, remember three days before the election there is that whole thing about the emails again and uh, so that was a trivial situational factor random uh, that probably uh, tipped the scales for a lot of people with her uh, and other trivial situational factors uh, we can't go to a sonic because I don't think there's sonics here in New York City so there we go but each one of these, uh, one way to resolve them is through uh, trivial situational factors. Uh, for example, condom use. Uh, McDonald and Heine in 2008 looked at college students and they surveyed college students 
in a perspective design, and that means that pro means before. So they uh, looked at uh, subjects uh, before the events happened and then afterwards. Uh, so whenever you um, meet with the subjects before things happen, that's a prospective design. And in the first session, they asked the subjects, do you plan to have sex in the next two weeks? And if you do, do you plan to use a condom? And almost all, you know, and subjects said, well, I, you know, I don't really plan to have sex, or some said that they do plan, but most said that if they will have sex, they will definitely use a condom. So the key thing here from the uh, first session is that subjects were very positive about using a condom. Almost, I think, 100% said they will use a condom if they had sex. So then they waited two weeks, called them back in the lab, and said, uh, did you have sex in the last two weeks? Yes or no? And when you did have sex, did you have a condom? And here's what they found out of the 65 participants. Uh, those that said yes, 91% uh, uh, that said yes, they had sex, Oh, excuse me. Uh, that's not correct. Uh, let's go back a second. Here. There we go. Uh, so they asked them, did you use a con, you know, was the intercourse planned or not? And out of those that said yes, if the intercourse was planned, 91% said that they used a condom. What about the people who said they had sex but it was not planned? How many used a condom? That dropped down to 58%. And so what we see here is that when you're able to plan something, you're able to express your attitude, but if the intercourse was unplanned and kind of happened you know, in a trivial fashion or non, uh, random fashion, uh, then you were not prepared and so you uh, did not use a condom as much as you did if you had actually intended to have sex. And also this, the planned intercourse situation, was where the use of the condoms mirrored the very high levels of the attitude of wanting to use a condom. So another example of how trivial factors can affect the expression of an attitude, especially an attitude you're ambiguous about. And then the other way of resolving attitude ambivalence is psychological distance. And what do I mean by psychological distance? This is uh, a conceptual term where uh, psychological distance means how psychologically close something is to you. Not physically close, but how psychologically close. So for example, my wife is more psychologically close to me than my mother uh, because I care for her so much uh, more. Uh, my, you know, uh, California, the fires in California are, you know, more psychologically distance, uh, distant than worrying about uh, COVID because COVID is right here in New York City, but the fires in California are you know, actually a physical distance away. Or, for example, uh, worrying about uh, what happens uh, in terms of eating out in New York City when the winter comes. Uh, that's more psychologically distant than right now because that's like a month or two away. Uh, because the outdoor dining doesn't end until the end of October. So we're talking about all different types of distance. And what researchers have known for a while is that this approach system or the in favor or the positive mental system, the pro positive brain systems, they're stronger and they predominate at a larger psychological distance. Uh, so therefore, let's say that I have had ambivalent attitudes about Hillary Clinton. Uh, I have, you know, I had positive and negative feelings about Hillary Clinton, uh, hypothetically. And so, 
as it got closer to the election, uh, you know, these uh, positive feelings got weaker and weaker and at a long, you know, temporal distance. When that decision was a far away, uh, you know, situation, uh, those positive feelings were much more stronger. And then the avoidance or the against, against system, against, the against system or the negative system, it predominates or it's stronger at close range. And so let's say that if we get closer and closer to the election, and I realize I have to decide, then the avoidance or the anti-attitudes about Hillary Clinton get stronger and stronger and stronger. Uh, and I say that hypothetically uh, because really I have mainly positive feelings about her, uh, but that was just a hypothetical. And so that's ha another way in which we resolve uh, attitude ambivalence by the psychological distance. Again, uh, close range negative wins out at a distance, positive wins out. Oh, and I had a couple examples of that. I'm sorry, uh, I got rid of the slide, I don't know why. So uh, one example is Hillary Clinton. Another is abortion. Uh, as I said, Americans have uh, ambiguous attitudes towards abortion. And the way it works out, if you can think about uh, this systematically, I have to click twice to get my pen back after I erase for some reason, uh, but uh, at a distance, at a psychological distance, the positive or the approach attitudes are stronger. So when you ask people about abortion and you do it in a way that highlights the psychological distance, you get an expression of their in favor attitudes. Do you believe that a woman should have a right to have an abortion if she so chooses? Now, that is phrased abstractly, and anything abstract is at a great psychological distance. And so most people are in favor of the right of a woman to have an abortion on demand because, that, because it's phrased and it actually exists as an abstraction. And so uh, we see that as you know, a much more positive thing, and that's how we get rid of our ambivalence. However, when people think about themselves having an abortion, or you question them about themselves or a family member, your wife or daughter uh, or mother having an abortion, now the psychological distance is close, and the negative avoidance attitudes are stronger, and you see more negative expressions of the attitude. And then finally, uh, as we'll see in a couple of weeks, uh, racial attitudes in America uh, are ambivalent. That is, white people have very strong positive and negative attitudes towards African Americans. And so if uh, white people are ambivalent about African Americans, then they go around with these balanced, mixed feelings and the psychological distance will again determine which set uh, is expressed in a situation. So when you ask white Americans about laws, about should we have laws that uh, allow uh, people of different races to get married, uh, that's you know, an abstraction, so it's a distance, so the positive attitudes uh, win out and so people will white people will generally say oh yeah of course you know it's just horrible to have it laws that bar people of different races from uh, getting married but then we change the way we're phrasing the question uh, would you be okay with your daughter or son or brother or sister to marry a person of a different race now that it's at close range the avoidance attitudes become stronger and people express